WebNV has been around for about uh, 10 years. In 2015, we ran into a big issue. We effectively ran out of minimum performance optimizations. And uh, a lot of that was related to the uh, kind of architecture that we were using, but uh, we also had some hard requirements that we also wanted to, uh, to sort out, which was really hard to do. The primary one of them was that we wanted to also support uh, Linux and uh, non-Linux operating systems, and we wanted to reduce our support by as you can imagine, a database needs to have 24-7 support, and uh, we ran into issues. A lot of them were our faults, but a lot of them were stuff that uh, were hard or impossible to, to fix. So when we looked at our issues, we had two options. One of them was basically write everything in C. This is the natural options for databases in most cases. And this is something that we seriously consider. The disadvantages of writing something in C is obviously that the uh, the cost and complexity is much higher, and you lose a lot of features and capabilities. Uh, at the time, the core sila was still called uh, DNX, and it was quite old. And uh, but it really was able to run stuff on the uh, on Linux, uh, there was already starting to be some focus on performance, which we really liked. And one of the things that, uh, the reason that we decided to go with uh, DNX was that we had the uh, back of strategy of, okay, if this ends up being another Silverlight, then we at least are not in a worse off state than we were at at the beginning of only being able to run on the full .NET framework. And being able to run a cross platform, we have already started doing some spikes and tests, and uh, even DNX at the time was still much, much, much better than uh, trying to run on Mono, so that was a pretty good thing from our point of view. Um, something that I can't emphasize enough uh, with the nature of course Scylla, and the ability to accept patches. It used to be the case that you found a bug and you submitted to Microsoft Connect and it would take anywhere between two years and never to get a fix. And even from the get-go, we had an amazing uh, interactions with the team, uh, both in here's an issue, can you fix it? And the team said yes, or here's an issue, here's the fix. And the team work with us in, a, in order to actually, oh, this is what needs to be done in order to get this accepted. Here are these other considerations that you need to do. And uh, the experience has been much better. Another very important consideration from our perspective about using the Corsilla is the ability to uh, embed the data environment inside our deployment uh, zip file, basically. The idea here is that instead of having to rely on the administrator to install a system-wide uh, update, we can package the concealer along with our software, so we can do a couple of important things. One, we uh, can just upgrade to the next version or, uh, or stay with a particular version of the concealer as long as we want. And uh, if necessary, we can run on our own patched version uh, without having a global impact on the system. Okay, I mentioned performance, and I want to talk about what is fast. You can see some numbers on a per second, a uh, number of requests per second, how many requests it actually means you're handling on a per day. And the most important thing about it is how much a, a budget this gives you. Now, this is you, a single server with eight cores, and that's a ridiculous model of time. If you, and most users would be somewhere within the first three or four items. So you may get as much as 80 milliseconds to process a request in the common scenario. By the way, I'm assuming here that we're doing things sequentially, but obviously we're, we're going to have to, to do things in parallel, but that's a huge amount of time that you have to process a request. Uh, 80 milliseconds is forever for a modern CPU. 
it gets interesting when you start wanting to move to the 10,000 requests a second, 100,000 requests a second, because at that point, the budget that you have is much smaller. And we set a goal. I want to be 10 times faster than the previous version. And when I set this goal, I got lots of funny looks from my team, because that's a ridiculous goal. How can we, we be that much faster? You remember at that time, we were uh, three and a half uh, uh, releases out, and every single release that we made so far had been with a, a some focus on performance. And the first thing that uh, we looked at is how can we make it faster? And right now, with .NET Core uh, 3.0 and some of the uh, .NET Core Scala, uh, 3.0 and some of the performance optimizations, you can actually probably just recompile and run it and you will get some speed ups just from the platform improvements. The problem with that is that uh, there is a high bound to that, also a very small bound to that, to the level of improvement you can get from just recompiling the platform. And the really thing that we want, the, the big thing that we wanted to do was to get much higher than that. So I want to talk about one of the most common issues that we had with uh, the previous version of RevDB, and this is the GC. And the GC has been something that we have been fighting for for a very long time. And you can see here some some uh, GC pauses and how it works. You operate, you operate, you operate, and suddenly you have a huge spike and your 99 percenters basically goes to the crapper, and it is not something that you can usually uh, uh, see or visualize very efficiently. It gets worse if you are under memory pressure, or suddenly your performance tanks because you're now at 90 percent time in GC all the time. So it's easy to know how to fix that. You need to uh, control your location, you need maybe to use some management, but it's impossible to actually do that on an existing system because uh, it's everywhere. Manage location everywhere, and a, in a manager with like C sharp, you tend not to care very much about memory ownership, who does what, how long an allocation leaves, and stuff like that. Especially not if the code hasn't been built specifically for that purpose. So I want to give you a good, a good example of that. So RevDB is a document database. It stores the data in JSON format. The, uh, the, in, in the 355 version, we store the data on this as JSON. That means that whenever we needed to read a document, we have to read it from this. We have to parse JSON into an in-memory data structure, and uh, only then we'll be able to work on that. As you can imagine, uh, I/O and parsing costs are non-trivial, uh, especially if you're running if you're running on cloud machines, if you're running on HDDs or any of these sorts. It can be extremely expensive. So the natural thing that you want to do is to use a cache. Instead of going to this each and every time, what we're going to do, we're just going to have a dictionary somewhere or memory cache or whatever that a, a cache the the parse document objects. It turns out this is to be one of the key issues that we had. And a, a performance optimization that we applied was disabling the cache. Why disabling the cache? I want to explain to you what's going on. If the work is the amount of memory that you typically use is bigger than the amount of memory that you actually have, then the following things would happen. Uh, you would read an object from disk, parse it, put it in the cache, which is great. The cache would then hold that object, which means that the GC wouldn't be able to get rid of that. The problem is that if the GC notices that your objects aren't, uh, are being held for a long time, they are going to be pushed into the next generation. And the GC, the way that the uh, generation GC in uh, Coursera works, you have Gen, A, Gen 0, Gen 1, Gen 2, and uh, Gen 1 and 2 are being uh, uh, collected a lot, less, a lot less frequently because collecting older generation is much more expensive. The cache would explicitly push all of those objects to a later generation. When you actually have a memory pressure 
the, the cashier says, oh, okay, I know what, I, what I'm going to do. I'm going to a, a stop holding on to these objects, which wouldn't actually free them. You would have to wait another uh, GC cycle or two to actually free that memory. At that time, the cashier says, oh, I'm empty. I can uh, uh, get more, more data and it would start holding more and more documents. And those documents, because of uh, uh, the, G the memory pressure, would have a lot more GCs. The new objects would end up in Gen 2, and the cycle would continue. We effectively spent greater than 90% of the time, in some cases, just in GC under this specific scenario. And that was something that was very hard or impossible to solve in a meaningful fashion. So that's that's something that you have to take into account. And we didn't know really how to solve that, especially because uh, um, the entire, our entire project, which was something like a million lines of code, worked in this fashion. So the first thing that we need to do before going over or oh, moving to Corsilla or moving to something else was to figure out how we can change the uh, most basic assumptions that we had. And the thing that we do, we created this binary format. And you can see basically the difference between a, a JSON document and a binary format. And the idea here is that a JSON object, a JSON text needs to be parsed before it can be used. This binary format, which we called obliterable, is just meant to be, oh, uh, if I want to know what the first name of this document here, in this case, I need to, okay, read this, read this, oh, first name, now I got that. In the case of the binary format, I can do, oh, I can see that the first name is here, and this is the first name, or something like that. So it's readily usable, there is no parser required, and most importantly, from our perspective, we just had bytes. There is there is no manager of the whatsoever. Uh, one of the interesting about the cost of GCs is that the cost of GCs is actually uh, proportional to the number of objects that you have. So if you have a few arrays, it's much cheaper than if you have the same information as many different objects because the GC doesn't have to scan through all of them. Uh, but we actually took it further and said that the format is going to be a zero copy structure, which means that I can uh, look at a piece of memory and immediately start uh, uh, utilizing that. Um, this is important because we can now use memory map files. And instead of building our own cache in managed code, we're going to say something like this. Okay, there is already a cache at the operating system layer. There is, also, there is already a, a, a way for the operating system to avoid going to disk if necessary. So if we store our data, our actual physical data, on memory map files, when we access the data, we uh, we don't need to uh, do any sort of allocations. And this is the typical way of uh, working with the request inside of the RevLV code base. We have some requests, we have some code to get a position in memory map file, and then we can just write it out to the client without doing any allocations along the way. And that means that obviously we save a lot of uh, work. It also means that we get a lot of interesting benefits. Uh, the open system itself is going to handle caching. The uh, GC is not involved because there are no managed objects being allocated, and that uh, reduces the overall cost dramatically. Uh, we also did a whole bunch of things wrong intentionally. So we use a workstation GC, we a, a, a set all sorts of parameters to make sure that the GC would happen very frequently and a, a be as expensive as possible. Just to give you some idea, when we switch on benchmarks from workstation to server GC, we get 30,000 requests per second just from a, a, that change. A, but being making sure that the uh, GC cost was highly visible for us was very important to, make, to making sure the development process we pay attention to that because it's very easy to think, oh, I'm just doing a new, it's, co it's cost nothing. And it's, you're correct, it doesn't cost nothing right now. At some point in the future, you're going to pay for that, and unfortunately, sometimes with interest. Okay. Okay. So, 
in order to control managed memory usage, there are a whole bunch of uh, uh, options. A pooling object is the most common one. Uh, we found that uh, arrays and buffer are all, all the most obvious ones, but we also have a pooling for just common use objects. I have a class that I use to uh, say where is a particular uh, data or disk. And I have a whole list of, of them that I keep around and reuse over and over. They end up being in Gen 2, and the GC doesn't really uh, touch them all of the time. There is also a uh, lot of use of structs, lot of use of the lower level features of C Sharp uh, in order to really control what's going on. The way that we uh, work with moving RavenDB from the .NET, .NET framework to .NET Core was to do basically start a new solution and move one item at a time. And effectively, that was uh, one major refactor because every time that we move a feature, we applied all of these considerations to it. Okay, um, we are writing a document to the network. How? What allocation are we generating? Uh, we did okay. Uh, you made a test run, now run them under a, a profiler, check allocation, set cost, all of that. And that allowed us to, in a very granular fashion, to optimize specific things. Memory is still a, an issue. So uh, what we've done, we have decided that for the most part, I don't want to use managed memory for the a, a most common things that I'm using. I'm going to move that into native memory. I'm going to be managing that myself. And the idea here is that this gives me a lot more uh, uh, several for optimizations. For example, during the process of request, I allocate some memory up front. And I get any anything that I want to do, I get I, I allocate from that location. And here I'm talking about uh, unmanaged objects and uh, byte buffers and stuff like that. At the end of the request, I free this memory by just setting the uh, uh, just setting uh, where where should I start allocating the next memory back to the origin of the, the origin point of the buffer. The idea here is that now instead of having to do any sort of GC, I just uh, effectively clear the array and start from scratch. The key from our perspective is that uh, we still get the benefits of a GC language. Uh, we, we have all of those buffers and unmanaged memory are actually being held by a, an instance of a managed class, which has a finalizer. So that frees us from, from having to worry about the some edge cases. I can say, okay, I'm allocated this memory, I'm going to work with that, and uh, worst case now, I missed a, a, some a edge case, an exception was thrown, I didn't write a final report or something like that, then that piece of memory is going to be lost, but because it is being held by a managed object that has a finalizer, it is actually going to be finalized. And that means that they have a really nice cushion, I don't have to worry about uh, every little uh, tidbit. Now, uh, from the point of view of the architecture, we had an arena allocator and we have a context and every a request as a context it is, and once the request is done, we can use the, that memory. Uh, for the point of view of the coding, we effectively have a budget, and we measure allocations, we are using memory, and we said, okay, every time that I run this code, how much memory are we allocating, how much managed memory, how, what is the retention for those objects, all of that. Um, you can see, and, it's funny because we've done that several years ago and you can see some of those things happening now with arena allocators coming to the .NET Core with all of the uh, spans that are now being very commonly used in everywhere in the API, which is something that we found amazingly good for us. Now, something that, in terms of performance, something that I really want to, uh, to emphasize we effectively uh, started everything from scratch. And one of the things that we have decided was that we don't want to uh, do everything ourselves. On the other hand, I'm going to look at what the uh, uh, platform, open system, and hardware is doing, and then I'm going to, to base 
my system on the best, uh, on the heuristics that they use. For example, in managed memory, we know that there are two types of good allocations. If you have a very short allocation that uh, uh, is gone very quickly, goes to just zero, relatively low cost, or if you have very long allocation that are held for uh, uh, minutes, hours, days, uh, stuff like that, uh, minutes, not so long, by the way. Try hours or days for lower locations. And those are good because then the GC can mostly just ignore that piece of memory. But anything else is a bad idea. So if you structure your code explicitly to be modeled around that, that gives you a lot of performance advantages just because you're matching the expectation of the underlying platform. If, for, in our example, by using the page case of the OH, then we're able to not have any caching code in of MDB. And we get decades of experience of how do we manage the cache, how do we a, a balance load across the entire system, not just my a particular process and stuff like that. Okay, for example, um, how you can use those underlying assumptions. Let's talk about memory hierarchies. Uh, in your system, you typically have the hard disk, the memory, and then you have the L3, L2, L1 uh, caches in the CPU, and those end up actually met, uh, mattering quite a lot. So um, we build a routing system, and that routing system was built specifically to fit into the uh, into the processor cache and that end up being a major performance boost. So let's, I want to show you some of those options. So this is the LVC routing, and this is a fairly old uh, implementation, but you can see that it does thing fairly well. So we are processing 20, uh, 2.5 million requests in under millisecond per each request. Now, this was not called, and again, 2015 era uh, code here, but this is not a code that is being uh, written for performance sake. Now, let's look at Nancy's routing. And Nancy's routing uses an algorithm called a tray, and you can see that this is much, much better. Having the same number of calls in, I don't know, 2% uh, of, uh, of the cost. Now, we wrote our own system using uh, the same algorithm as Nancy, using a tray. But we did, we did that with zero locations, we did that with an eye to the memory structures of the, uh, of the hardware. So in this case, we know that we are jumping into a well-known cache line inside of, the, uh, in, inside of the tray, and that means that it's probably going to be the L1 or L2 cache, that means that we get a major a, a speed boost from the overall system. And you can see that we spend less than one microsecond per routing call. And just to be clear, this is done under the profiler. So we are actually paying quite a lot to do that, and we are still being very, very efficient. Now, one of our requirements was case-insensitive routing. So it doesn't matter what case you use, I want to route it to the right location. Case insensitive stream matching is really expensive. It's expensive if all you're doing is asking, but if you're also doing, a, a, if you want to do that on a, a, the whole Unicode range, that's ridiculously costly. It's actually, a, and we had an observation that uh, for the most part, the actual uh, casing that is being used is always the same. So it's actually cheaper to force to a case sensitive search if we don't find it, do a case insensitive match and add that to the case sensitive list. So we effectively do memorization and very quickly we know what are the actual case sensitive routes that are being used and we get major benefits out of that. I mentioned the things that are expensive. So expensive for a bunch of reasons. One of them is the allocation, but there are certain simple operations that are actually quite costly. Changing the ends width to the explicit uh, uh, child check 
is just gave us 2,000 requests per second, just this. And we had multiple rounds like that where we basically go and look at the uh, profile results. What's expensive? Let's fix that. What's expensive? Let's fix that. Um, I think that in this case, uh, what happened was that uh, the ends we needs to handle with a string of any length. So there is a whole bunch of code that's being run there. This was just basically just inline. This was the a bound check was probably leaded, and we had one byte or one character uh, check, and that was it. And the cost was, as you can see, it's astronomical. String are also really, really expensive because of allocations. So what we end up doing is effectively create our own string type. The underlying uh, backing store for the string is in unmanaged memory inside of our arena allocator, which means that we can allocate a string very, very cheaply. There is no GC, and we have a whole bunch of other uh, smarts going on in order to reduce the cost even further. The underlying, uh, the underlying result is that we would typically, in our old system, if we would open a, a dump, we would see that the primary reason for memory utilization in our system, our strings. And there have been uh, some studies from uh, Stack Overflow where about 70% of the memory cost is around strings. And we're able to throw all of that around. Another benefit for us is also that our string is UTF-8 instead of uh, UTF-16. So that also reduces some of our memory usage that uh, we had to deal with. Um, we had a whole bunch of issues like this, where we work with the core team to optimize how the system is working. Uh, here is an example of working with this, with the, uh, okay, let's recognize this pattern, and this is very common in uh, hashing, crypto, uh, crypto and stuff like that, to the best uh, underlying assembly instruction. It's funny because sometimes for very specific hotspots, you would see us writing a code in C sharp and then go and look at the assembly and then play with the C sharp code to get it to IL, to get it to G, and then uh, see how it works. And we had several cases like this where we actually talked to the course in Latin to get better results and better smiles for the whole platform. Uh, something, if you care about performance, go read the Rosin Guide. It's really interesting. You get to uh, to see some of the more common uh, issues, and just changing this to for loop give you t three thousand requests per second. And again, Arsenal is very demanding, very high performance. We are absolutely uh, willing to accept higher degree of complexity in order to get better performance. The Rosin uh, uh, style guide. Uh, also wants higher performance, not really to go that far in order to get them. So it might be something that you want to, to apply in a more general sense. Uh, I want to give you one example. So there's a whole bunch of things that you can do in order to deal with uh, lower level stuff optimizations. Here is an example. Take a moment to look at this code. And uh, what we're doing here, we are basically doing string comparison. To, to be able to find whatever a particular string equal or does not equal a particular value. And this code is utterly unreadable, but it allows me to do a comparison on an 11 byte string in three operations, in three assembly instructions. And that means that I'm able to reduce specific hotspots significantly. I don't recommend it to do it on a general in general way, but in most cases you see hotspots and it might be worth it because the benefit can be quite amazing. RevenB is a database. One of the key issues that we have to deal with is that we have to deal with IO. And IO is very slow. And the web that and that's critical for our performance. So one of the things that we have done is effectively don't pay for every single I/O. Pay it in bulk. Take 
10 rights to the disc and 7 in one shot. And it's interesting because the cost of writing 16 kilobyte or writing 128 kilobyte is roughly the same, which is a uh, great thing to take advantage of. Yep. Hey, Oren, yes. I just wanted mm -hmm. to let you know we are right on time. That's for, great. For the presentation. So, so great. So one thing, I love it that the Corsilla is doing a lot of interesting optimizations that are small, but they aggregate a lot. And the funny, thing that, the funny thing that I want to say is that a lot of the things that we've done wasn't so much with the stuff that we did, but understanding the platform and actually getting things right for the assumption that the platform is making, which gives us much better performance. And that's it. Perfect. Oh, wow. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Sure. So we were looking on the, on the chat and... Again, there were no questions because everybody was just learning. I mean, we were just discussing your uh, ends with optimization. Mm -hmm. now, and we were like, wow, I mean, just <laughs> something as simple as that, the perf you gain, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, you, you sometimes see, uh, it's funny because uh, when you look at the profiler and you know that you're not going to see the the, the things you expect. Right. But also, are you actually telling me that this single line of code hide that much complexity. The the Lambda example is even worse than that because you don't notice that. You, uh, I had a case where you do uh, items.all, uh, other items.contains. Yep. Yeah, and right. you pay for the uh, delicate invocation, you pay for a, a O in search, and sometimes you pay for uh, something, something like this can hide uh, N square cost. Right. And then you're like, oh, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And But yeah, something like that, 2,000 requests per second, just, just like that. Yeah, wow, and, yeah. And, and yeah so one thing to notice, if you're doing stuff like that, beware it's addictive. Oh, sure, yeah, I mean, it's just like yeah. you said, it's a, it's a slippery slope. So, oh, yeah. all right, we had one question here, but I uh, was wondering if, uh, the, if the person who asked it, if we can ask it via Twitter, since we have to go to the other speaker because we're trying to stay in time. So Oren, thank you so much for taking the time to speak. This was amazing. Uh, like always, I love, I love, we love to hear you talk and share your knowledge. So thank you so much. Uh, everybody, we're on the process. We're going to get um, Halil here up and going, calling. Uh, again, Oren, thank you so much, and we'll be right thank back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Yep, thanks.